So I'm Dr. White, geriatric psychiatrist. I help run the memory assessment program. A lot of families bring in their loved ones concerned about cognitive changes. What is dementia? It's a brain cell death. I always like to put things in layman's terms for the patients and their families, right, to understand. So it's brain cell death, typically progressive and very typically fatal. And there's many different types of dementia, just like there's many different types of colors. What's the most common type of dementia out there? Alzheimer's disease, right? By the time you're 85 in this country, you have a what percent chance of having Alzheimer's disease? 50, right? One out of two. The correct term is major neurocognitive disorder. I'm going to say dementia. I'm just so used to saying dementia, but technically the newest medical jargon is major neurocognitive disorder. So they are equivalent or synonymous. Dementia is when we have brain cell death that causes changes in our cognition. Our cognition is made up of these six domains listed here. And I'll give a few examples in the next few slides. When we have brain cell death, it affects our ability to attend ends our ability to problem solve and plan, that's what executive functioning means, our ability to make new memories and learn new information, what our memory center does, our ability to speak as well as comprehend what's being said to us, that's what our language center does, our ability to perceive objects in space, a sense of direction, our death perception, motor planning, that's what the back part of our brain does, and our social cognition, which allows us to behave appropriately in public, part of the front part of the brain. When we have brain cell death, there's going to be changes in these domains, and it will interfere with our ability to function, can't pay our bills, we can't drive our cars, we can't take our medicines correctly, we can't plan what we want to eat, can't shop for what we want to eat. That means we're demented. Brain cell death causing changes in cognitive domains leading to changes in our ability to care for oneself. Obviously they can occur while we're delirious, an acute confusional state due to medications or medical illness. That doesn't count. You can't be delirious. Well, you can be delirious and have dementia, but you can't diagnose dementia in the setting of delirium. You can't be depressed either. Depression certainly comes with cognitive changes in all these domains too. You have to try to differentiate that. Again, there's major neurocognitive disorder, which I'm going to call as dementia. And there's minor neurocognitive disorder, which we're going to also call MCI. To be demented, again, you need significant cognitive decline or significant brain cell death. If you have a lot of brain cell death, if I give you a paper pencil test called neuropsychological testing, just two, three hours, or the MOCA. MOCA is a small version of a neuropsychological test, which you're going to do poorly on it because of all that brain cell death. And again, it has to interfere with your ability to care for oneself. If you're kind of impaired, the minor neurocognitive disorder, you got some brain cell death, so your score is going to be a little lower on the test than we would expect for your age and education, but you're still really able to function on your own independently with minimal support from others. That's called minor neurocognitive disorder, or MCI. MCI typically precedes dementia, but it is not a guarantee to progress into a dementia. If we're a you know, little change, we're not as adept as we once were with our memory. We're not as adept in our problem solving, but it's not causing changes in our everyday life where I need someone to supervise me. That's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, also called mild neurocognitive disorder. Again, these are the six domains. I'll give you some examples of each. Tried to break it up into mild neurocognitive disorder and major neurocognitive disorder. Do examples of each. It's really difficult if I'm in your shoes to understand what I'm saying because we take all these things for granted that we can do all of these tasks, right? What's executive function? That's our ability to problem solve, plan, figure something out, see the big picture, inhibit, disinhibit our behavior, insight. Apathy. All these fall under the front part of our brain, our executive function. This is the domain that's indicated first in Alzheimer's disease. We have a disease that gets into our memory center, so we can't make new memories. So what's the patient going to do? They're going to repeat themselves. They're going to ask the same questions, tell the same stories, forget conversations. Mom, we just talked about this last week. Don't you remember we had this conversation? No, you don't remember that? purpose of our memory is to learn. So you try to teach them something, this new iPad, this new iPhone, new remote control we got. They have difficulty learning new information. The non-Alzheimer's dementias typically don't begin with changes in the memory center. They begin with other domains initially. As dementias spread out four, five, six years into any type of dementia, they all kind of look the same because the disease has spread out and affected all parts of the brain through brain cell death, right? Here's just a graph of uh, four big dementias or major neurocognitive disorders. You can see Alzheimer's dominates, and then we have vascular dementia, Lewy body, frontotemporal, and there's a few others. But when I'm seeing someone who comes in for a cognitive concern brought in by their family because ubiquitously all patients lose insight into their condition, so they're not going to come in on their own volunteering information because they've lost awareness and insight of what is wrong. So the family typically brings them in. Most of the time it's going to be Alzheimer's disease. So what do I do every day? I talk to the family, what were the first changes 
that you notice, get a good history. Again, typically the patient's not going to volunteer this information because if the disease, whatever it is, has gotten to the front part of the brain, they've lost awareness and insight for different, subtly different, that something's amiss, so they're not going to tell me what's wrong. Family needs to tell me, yes, the person's forgetting, or the person's having problems with problem solving or planning, they're getting lost while driving, they can't get the words out, their personality has changed, for instance. I'm always going to look at the medications. We take too much medication sometimes. That can cause changes in our behavior. CAM is a screening tool for delirium, so but that's going to kind of come from your history. Has the patient been recently sick? Depression screen. Again, I need to rule out depression. We're going to do a MOCA, some sort of cognitive screen to say, look, this person has had a change in their thinking abilities, and here it is on paper. A lot of times we don't have pertinent or focal exam findings, but sometimes you do. It's a vascular dementia, which means you've had a stroke. You might have some weakness, certainly. Uh, you might see changes in their walking. If it's a Lewy body dementia, which we'll get into, or an NPH presentation, which we'll get into. Typically, Alzheimer's disease, the exam findings are normal or benign. Labs, sometimes when we have changes in these vitamins or uh, medical conditions, they can cause changes in our thinking abilities. We need to rule them out, saying, hey, it's not due to their thyroid dysfunction. That's why they're forgetting. I always get a brain image. I need a CAT scan or an MRI, though MRI is preferred because that allows me to see the smaller strokes in more detail, the brain MRI. Again, maybe there's a big tumor. Maybe there's NPH. Maybe there's been a stroke that could account for what we're seeing. And sometimes if the history lends itself to, we'll get some additional blood work. But technically, we, we don't do that on a usual basis. Again, Alzheimer's disease, the most common type of dementia. Easy to see the distinction between normal brain and brain cell death. First change is in our memory. It's when a bad disease gets into our memory center and then slowly starts to spread out. And so the initial symptoms are going to be in memory. Dementia is changes in our cognition causing problems in everyday life. Alzheimer's begins in the memory center. It's irreversible. It's the fifth leading cause of death. Alzheimer's disease is guaranteed to kill you. People, before they get to full-blown dementia where their IADLs are impaired, they go through what's called amnestic MCI. It's not a guarantee they're going to progress, but it's a good chance. The amount of people are projected to have Alzheimer's disease in the future, being that age is the biggest risk factor, as start to live longer, as we are, we're going to see more and more people have it. This slide says if you're in the hospital with these comorbid conditions, you'll stay longer when you have Alzheimer's disease. It costs lots and lots of money to care for patients with Alzheimer's disease. When you have Alzheimer's disease, ubiquitously, you have no insight into your condition. So it's really, really hard, right, for a family to get involved and say, Mom, you've been missing this, you're missing that, you're not planning this, you're getting that wrong, you're not taking your meds, you shouldn't be driving, you're getting lost. And they say, no, I'm not. I'm fine. But, Mom, you, you but, 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 no. There's no convincing when you don't have a front part of the brain. Prevalence of Alzheimer's by the time you're 85 in this country is 50%. I don't know any other disease that's 50% prevalent by the time you're 85 and it's 100% mortality rate. So again, these are the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease. If the disease affects the memory center first, we're going to see short-term memory loss, right? So mom, we had that conversation just the other day. Don't you remember? You can't find your pocketbook. Where did you put it last? You can't retrace your steps to find it. That's what our short-term memory center does. It's called the hippocampus. And numbers 9 and 10, I think, are just as important as any of the other ones. These are the personality changes that can come about with Alzheimer's disease. Initially, it's somewhat embarrassing, obviously, when we are aware that there are changes. So we might withdraw from activities. As the disease progresses, you will lose that awareness. And we've withdrawn from activities. We're more anxious. We're more irritable. We've lost a little bit of weight. We can't and concentrate as well, but these can be your first symptoms along with the memory loss of Alzheimer's disease, and it doesn't mean it's depression. The red represents bigger spaces. Here's it another way. Your left will be normal. Your right will be Alzheimer's disease. Again, brain shrinkage starting in the memory center. PET scan, and there's differences when we have Alzheimer's disease. Brain cell death, we're not using the sugars as well. So why do our brain cells die, right? We get this bad disease. So what's exactly happening? There's this bad disease getting into what we call the nucleus bacillus of, and that location in your brain sends projects a lot of cholinergic neurons and it projects them to the memory center projects them all over your cerebral cortex which is called your neocortex so if we get a bad disease starting there and it's sending extensions to our memory center and the rest of the brain we're going to get changes in our so this is what's happening again we don't I'm not you don't really know why it's starting, but well, this is what's actually happening. We're getting this bad protein called this amyloid beta protein being deposited in and around neurons. It starts to kill off the neurons, and the amyloid also it sets off these hyperphosphorylating this tau protein. And so the combination of this bad amyloid beta and these hyperphosphorylated tau leads to cell disruption. Then we get this inflammatory response. So that's what's happening. Why is it happening is the more difficult question. Here's a picture of amyloid around the brain cell. You get your healthy cells, and you start to lose our dendrites. 
Here's it put another way. Just imagine amyloid being deposited in and around that cell, and so we're starting to lose those synaptic connections. Amyloid precursor protein, APP, sticking out of the cell membrane. Certain enzymes cleave this protein, and we form this amyloid beta protein, and we bodies cannot get rid of it. I just put it another way in the slide. Here's just showing you amyloid beta accumulates in the, the cell and eventually leads to lysis. Here's that tau. I mentioned amyloid beta and tau. I think Alzheimer's disease, you want to think two bad proteins. Amyloid beta, we think amyloid beta hyperphosphorylates this protein called tau. Now, tau helps stabilize the microtubules in your cell. There are changes in your brain 15 to 20 years before symptoms develop. We have 100 billion brain cells. It's going to take a while for us to lose enough brain cells for symptoms to become clinically evident. In mild Alzheimer's disease, again, our IEDLs are impaired, our banking, our shopping, our driving, our medication administration, our finances. We get to moderate Alzheimer's disease. The disease spreads even further into the brain, or more so, or kills more brain cells, if you will. And the big hallmark here is your ADLs are impaired. Severe Alzheimer's disease, now we're totally dependent on someone else to help us become bed bound, you typically get some sort of illness that, like pneumonia that takes our life. Alzheimer's disease is unlearning everything you've ever learned. What are the risk factors? Age, as I mentioned, your biggest risk factor. Genes are your second biggest risk factor. The biggest one is called APOE4 allele or gene. Cholesterol carrying protein also potentiates inflammation. Any mutation in that APP gene, patients who have Down syndrome, the APP genes on chromosome 21. Patients who have Downs have three copies of chromosome 21, likely why their prevalence of Alzheimer's is 50% in their 60s. I've read other reports that say it's even higher than that. Not good to have head injuries, chronic concussions, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries are also risk factors. Females actually have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. They, the book always said, well, fem females live longer. And age is the biggest risk factor. So therefore, that's why, again, we don't know why. So that 5.8 million, two-thirds of them are females, and one-third are males. Only thing proven to build new brain cells is exercise. And it happens to build new brain cells in the memory center. This is vascular dementia, the second most common type. This is obviously when you have a, had a stroke in a certain part of the brain. And depending on where that location is, it's going to lead to the cognitive changes. So if it's in the memory center, if it's in the language center, if it's in the front part of the brain, you're going to see those deficits manifest themselves. They typically teach this, and the book will tell you. We, Dr. Rebecca and I, he actually texted me last night what you guys look at, your, your step one, uh, which I used to read to, your board exam. It literally says stepwise decline. That means you have a big stroke, knocks the patient down cognitively with their thinking ability. It's depending on where the location is. But I will tell you most commonly what I see is, what they don't mention in your book, is that the small little silent strokes that can add up over time. Poorly treated high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, smoking. These medical conditions can cause small little silent strokes in the brain to add up over time. So it's not necessarily a stepwise decline when you have a big stroke. It's these small little silent ones that do their damage. They're silent because there's no outward clinical manifestation, but they make a difference, like little potholes forming in your brain. So if you think of the vessels in your brain, like a tree, you have a big trunk, right? Those are your cerebral vessels, and you kind of you're branching off of your of your vessels. We'll call those lacunar infarcts if we have a stroke in them, and you kind of have your branching, branching like little twigs. We'll call them leucoariosis. So again, if you have a big vessel stroke. That's your stepwise decline. You kind of have your medium vessel, your small vessels that add up over time. That's the other presentation of vascular dementia. The most common type is when you have it in the intermediate vessel, the lacunar infarct. They oftentimes occur in the white matter tracts, typically in the tracts connect the top part of the brain to the bottom part of the brain. 50% of the time, again, they're silent, so you don't, there's no outward clinical manifestate, manifestation. Sometimes you do get some motor or sensory impairments as well. So here's kind of a picture. You get a radiology report, and they'll say there's been a lacunar infarct, and this part of the brain. Oftentimes I'll go to the family and they'll say, hey, you've had a stroke. And they'll say, I didn't know I had a stroke. What are you talking about? No one ever told me that before. I didn't feel anything. Pothole in the brain, obviously, and uh, information in the cognition will be impaired depending on where that is. A picture of periventricular around the ventricles. This is one of those small little vessels, the, brain, the twigs. All of us have this in our brain. So if we all got a brain MRI, it would probably say we have a little bit of small vessel disease periventricularly. It's normal to have a little bit. So when does it become abnormal? You can see the difference and you're relying on the neuroradiologist to tell you, I think this is more than to be expected for someone of this age. This neuroradiologist has looked at thousands of MRIs in his or her career. They're saying, look, I think there's more little white spaces here than I would expect. And you can see, obviously see the difference again. And we'll think of all these as small little silent strokes. You're not getting any of this back. It's going to leave its fingerprint in terms of your thinking abilities. And here's another example. Letter C, subcortical. It's, so there's around the ventricles and there's subcortical, which is below the cortex. And that's really where you connect the top part of the brain to the front part of the brain to the bottom part. And there's three major tracks. I just want you to know that when you have changes, small little silent strokes, 
in these tracks can lead to problems in our thinking abilities and problems in our behavior. So what does the patient present with? They're very, very slow, right? You have potholes in our brain, so they're very, very slow in their thought process and their ability to get words out. Walking slows, start shuffling their feet a little bit because these it's the front part of the brain, so we're slow. We can't lose our attention easily. We can't concentrate. I ask them to remember some words. They might not be able to tell me the words three minutes later, but if I give them a clue, they oftentimes are able to, which is why in your MOCA you're supposed to have a delay and then ask the patient the words again and give them a clue if they can't tell you them. An Alzheimer's disease patient never gets the words in, so it doesn't matter if I give them a clue or not. A vascular patient gets the words in, they just can't retrieve them. If I give them a clue, they're able to retrieve them a lot easier. As families will say, Doc, this person has a memory problem. They can't remember what I tell them. But you can imagine if the patient's not paying attention readily or having poor concentration, it's not that they can't remember, it's just that they're not able to attend very well. And oftentimes patients get very apathetic. Apathy is a frontal lobe feature. The front part of the brain, again, executive functioning, problem solving, planning, disinhibition, inhibition apathy, the inability to motivate behavior. So a lot of times these patients sit and they're content to sit. They're not depressed. These are our risk factors again, the high blood pressure, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, high cholesterol, sleep apnea is a huge one. And many other prevalence of sleep apnea in those over, uh, no, it's 70 in this country. It's like 30%. It's a tremendously prevalent condition. It doesn't matter your body habitus, doesn't matter your male or female. As you get older, everyone should be asked questions about it because it is so prevalent, under-recognized, and it can make a big difference if we treat it because sleep apnea is obviously not getting enough oxygen to the brain, right? I can't really get anything back if you've had these big strokes, these small little silent strokes, but we do try to put patients on uh, aspirin or statin medications to help prevent future strokes. Frontal lobe dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia obviously affects the front part of the brain. Initially, you can see that picture. The front part of the brain looks smaller, more atrophied, right, than the rest of the brain. Because we're hitting the front part of the brain, we're going to hit executive function, and we're going to hit social comportment. Temporal lobe is a little bit of memory, maybe a little bit of language. So again, it's the initial symptoms that are different. As the disease progresses, the rest of the brain will shrink. They're all equally devastating in their own right. This is a younger patient, typically, fifth, sixth decade of life. You can imagine how devastating this is for the family. It goes a little faster than Alzheimer's disease, which is eight to 10 years on average. This might be seven to eight years on average. It's called Pick's disease. That's the bad protein that develops. Again, we don't know why, we don't know how this all develops. Maybe a little bit of lifestyle, maybe a little bit of bad luck, maybe a little bit of genetics. So you're going to get someone in their 50s or 60s, loss of decorums or manners. So maybe they're touching inappropriately, kissing inappropriately in public. Maybe they're not respecting personal space. They're biting the line all the time. They're recklessly spending money, getting easily duped by telemarketers, speeding, promiscuity. Again, the front part of the brain that stops you guys from doing a lot of the things that maybe you shouldn't do. It can be very apathetic, loss of motivation, loss of goal-directed behavior, loss of empathy. Someone dies and, you know, they don't empathize appropriately, whatever. You know, hey, time to go while you're at a funeral. They'll pick up alcohol again or pick up smoking again when they've quit in the past. Tapping their fingers, pacing back and forth, repetitive trips to the bathroom, repetitive phrases over and over, picking at their skin. And because they're younger, often mistaken for a psychiatric condition, we have a change in behavior. Even though bipolar disorder typically manifests, you know, late teens, early 20s, most psychiatric disorders, 75%, in fact, develop before the age of 24. Because this person's younger overall in the grand scheme of things, bipolar disorder comes up. Everyone's called bipolar, right? Unfortunately, these days anyway. Especially if you have some reckless driving, reckless spending, that is one of the criteria for bipolar disorder, but they, they don't usually hit the other criteria. This is a fatal condition. You've told the patient's family they have a psychiatric condition that might be amenable to treatment. And what makes it so, so tough for the families is that the patient has no insight into their condition. Right. I know this is so hard for you guys to understand. It's like me telling you right now that you have dementia. You're all going to say, no, I don't. I'm fine. And I'm going to tell you you can't drive. You're going to say the same thing back to me. And I'm going to say your wife needs to take over your finances. You can't do them anymore. And you're going to say the same thing back to me. It's really hard for the family to have to deal 24-7 any type of dementia. And the patient doesn't have insight into their condition. How do you convince, show, explain, reason with someone who doesn't think they have a problem? That's what executive functioning is. It's the most difficult job on the planet to be a caregiver for someone with dementia. So the case I have when I first started, husband brought in the patient. He's a little older, but there have been some changes for a while now. He's eating lots of sweets. He was increasingly uh, offensive out in public. I remember I walked out to get something. I came back. She had opened up 
we gone into the drawer, opened up the candy that we put in a little bowl there on the table, started eating it all, which I didn't care about, right? But just the fact that you're going into someone else's drawer and opened up the candy, uh, she would down uh, the Anjumima syrup all in one uh, sitting. Changes in her social comportment. Got a brain MRI and lots of shrinkage in the front and medial side of the brain. Obviously, her IEDLs were being affected this whole time. He was having to take over the bill pay and the medication administration and the driving. So here's a picture. Orbital frontal in the top left there between the eyes. The top is an MRI. And the bottom is more of a PET scan, metabolism. You can see some of the shrinkage and the difference in color. Typically, it starts out asymmetrically on one side before it gets to the other side, but typically we're not seeing patients until a few years into the disease, so the brain's going to look symmetrical in its uh, atrophy. Uh, really, for any type of dementia other than Alzheimer's disease, and even those are symptomatic treatments, they're not curative or disease-modifying, unfortunately. But a lot of this becomes more of a palliative approach, helping the patient and the family along the way. Just a comparison of Alzheimer's disease and FTD. Third most common type, dementia of Lewy bodies. Um, this is a Lewy body. It's an abnormal conglomeration of alpha-synuclein protein. I think it's another bad protein getting up in the head and causing some brain cell death. Don't know why, don't know how. It just doesn't get in the brain, though, with, with this type of dementia. It gets all over the body, as the, the picture depicts. It's in the brain stem. It's around the heart, the intestines, the sex organs, the eyes. So a lot of times, you get this, these different symptoms, and you kind of have to be aware of this. You can put it together. To have Lewy body dementia, obviously, you need to be demented. Your IDLs have to be impaired. And you have these symptoms, these core symptoms, they call them. There's four of them. And the top three are come very early in the disease process. So you have these cognitive changes. And at the same time, this is the one that's you know, obviously the most obvious, the reported visual hallucinations. The family is telling you that the patient's seeing children, seeing adults, interacting with them, not really too distressed by it, typically. The patient will even tell you, too. Yeah, I see those children over there sometimes. They're differential for visual hallucinations in the older patient. There isn't much. And late onset schizophrenia, maybe. But Alzheimer's disease comes with visual hallucinations much later in the disease. Parkinson's much later in the disease. They're differential, and they're not delirious. They're not depressed. There isn't much else that it could be. This is a condition, REM sleep behavior disorder. It happens like 30 years prior to any other changes. Where during REM sleep or REM sleep, you're supposed to be atonic or without tone. You're not supposed to move around. These patients will kick punch, yell, scream, act like they're running away. It happens every REM sleep cycle, so it's like every two, three hours in your sleep cycle. You know, obviously, the person next to them is saying, stop kicking me, stop punching me, what's wrong? The differential for that is very small. This, again, happens maybe 40, 50 years of age. The average age is 75 for DLB, so it happens a long time prior. The delirium-like fluctuations, that's the most difficult to, to uh, come up with. This is just a minute or two, maybe, of just having a speech arrest or a motor arrest or just kind of staring out in space. I might catch a staring out in space sometimes. It might look like a seizure. It gets confused with a seizure sometimes. Could be a seizure. Two, Parkinsonism. This is a cousin to Parkinson's disease. That same bad alpha-synuclein protein is the same bad protein that happens in Parkinson's. But in Parkinson's, it just occurs in the brain. Here, again, it's all over the body. Well, obviously, the patient's going to become Parkinson's-like, right? Slowed movements, rigidity, bradykinesia, hand tremors, at rest. So now we have a patient with declining thinking ability. Memory is not the first one affected. More executive functioning. It's more visual-spatial, clinically and on testing. And they have these additional symptoms here. There's some biomarkers too. Again, we sometimes we get some imaging. MRIs, CTs, usually not helpful. You don't really see much on them. There's something called a DAT, D-A-T scan that's much more sensitive to changes in the basal ganglia area. This is why it's so hard. I like this the picture of the Venn diagram, multiple Venn diagrams. There's the motor domain, DLB, neuropsychiatric symptoms, that's the visual hallucinations. Cognitive, which is more executive functioning and visual spatial and testing or sleep changes, autonomic dysfunction as there is in Parkinson's disease too. You know, labile blood pressure, constipation, erectile dysfunction, sensory changes, typically loss of smells, big, big indicator. The patient can start at any point on these circles and they move towards the middle. So you might get autonomic instability first, less so cognitive, no visual hallucinations. So my point is this can take a while to diagnose. Look at the whole picture and put it together. Here's another case, 74, an average age of 75, periods of decreases in attention, fluctuating tension, some visual hallucinations. Maybe it was due to a urinary tract infection. Oftentimes we see that. Again, that's delirium. Now, now you asked me about it, doc. Yeah, my, she does thrash about it. Now Night. Funny you should say that. No one's ever asked about that before. And she's got some, again, autonomic instability, which includes orthostatic hypotension. She might, be, might fall a lot. They might fall early in the course of the disease. A Parkinson's patient falls late in the course of the disease. This is more early due to that reason. No medication technically indicated for this. We do give Aricept, which is the medicine we give for Alzheimer's disease patients, to increase the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the brain, because we think that helps stave off the decline, keeping brain cells talking to one another. And as the disease progresses and kills off more and more brain cells, 
doesn't matter if they're still talking to each other longer because eventually we're going to get to those as well. Another graph just to make it a little easier, probably a test question, visual hallucinations, Parkinson-like symptoms, lean you towards the dementia Lewy body. This graph depicts a steady decline, the slope, right? Parkinson's disease, about 50% of patients will develop dementia if you live long enough with Parkinson's disease. So dementia occurs towards the end, the thinking changes towards the end of the disease. DLB, your dementia Lewy body is towards the beginning. You have to be demented and then in a year develop those changes. Here it's you have motor symptoms for many, many years, and then you develop the cognitive changes. And again, it's executive dysfunction. That's the hallmark. There is a medicine. It's Aricept's sister or brother, called Exxon, that we give. Again, but we're just slowing it down, not curative. This is NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus, prevalent 6% over the age of 80. We don't know why. Most of the time, we develop NPH. The big ventricles, which is the hallmark of the condition. But if you test the pressure within the ventricles, it's normal. But the ventricles slowly expand. Again, we don't exactly know why. They start putting pressure on the white fiber tracts, corona radiata that run adjacent to that. So the patient has changes in their walking. They have changes in their ability to hold their urine. The thought process, again, kind their of thinking ability is the front part of the brain, especially it starts to change. So the gait disturbance is more wide-based. So they have their feet outward. And they kind of just plod along. Call it a magnetic gait. The patient doesn't take their feet off the floor. That's not always true. That's kind of your triad, and that's what they teach you in your books, right? Wet, wacky, wobbly. That's actually really uncommon to have all three percent. It's like 17 percent or some crazy stat like that where it's really not that common. Uh, you have to have the gait disturbance. Parkinson's patient, right, it's going to be narrow-based. This is going to be more, much more wider-based. And then within a few years, the urinary urgency starts, and then maybe a year or two, it's really related to incontinence. And around that same time, three, four years, you get the thinking ability changes. Here we have can actually do something. You can put it in a shunt from the ventricles to the abdomen, so it gets rid of all that excess fluid, puts it into the abdomen, and there comes a point where that shunt doesn't do anything. This is hard because remember I said vascular dementia comes with gait changes and urinary incontinence, executive dysfunction early on. This is the same triad. How do you know? You send the patient to a neurosurgeon. Uh, they'll, they'll stick a needle in your back. They'll take out some of your, your fluid, and if the patient's walking improves, pretty indicative that it is this condition, and it's also a good sign that the uh, shunt is going to work. Alzheimer's patients get really big ventricles too, but that's due to hydrocephalus ex vacuo. So the sulci, the brain shrinks, the gyrus gets smaller. With Alzheimer's disease, the brain's going to shrink, so it's not going to go out to the end. HIV patients certainly can get dementia too. Their CD4 count is particularly low. This is real. Patients get pretty clumsy early on. Again, thought process, executive dysfunction, uh, very sad. Huntington's disease patients, uh, that's where you have a CAG repeat, right? Chromosome 4, the Huntington's disease gene, dominantly inherited, autosomal dominantly inherited. Patients are very, very young, extremely, extremely sad. They can, Huntington's patients can present with effective changes, cognitive changes, or the movement changes. But most of the time, they will have, if you live long enough, they will have dementia set in. Uh, I've seen one of these cases, literally one in a million for the book. Extremely fast-moving type of dementia, 100% fatal, average age 55 to 75. It's when the PRP protein just keeps on misfolding and it eventually ransacks the brain. Terrible, terrible quickness. You know, most people say, oh, doesn't dementia go really, really slow? Typically, yes. This is extremely fast-moving disease. EEG has a characteristic signal. CSF testing has a characteristic protein that you find within it. Again, we don't know what sets it off. Sometimes if you're, if you're cannibal, this happens sometimes. Most of the time, it's just sporadic and bad luck. Lastly, alcohol, not in moderation, is a bad thing. But if you drink too much alcohol for too long a period of time, it's going to kill brain cells. It's also going to lead to a thymine deficiency, which also can cause changes in our, in our thinking ability. That's called the Warnke-Korsakoff syndrome. You can stay here forever if you don't have any additional strokes. Here, if you stop drinking, so I'm OK with a little bit of alcohol. You know, the Mediterranean diet does call for one glass of wine a day. Just be careful.